Well, aloha everyone, and welcome back to Human Nutrition here at Chaminade University. Today we will be discussing Unit 10, namely weight management and energy balance. We will be discussing the terms involved in energy balance, including positive and negative energy balance as they relate to your body weight. We will explain all of the factors that contribute to your total daily energy expenditure, or TDEE, including your basal metabolic rate, the thermic effect of food and exercise, and adaptive thermogenesis. We'll talk about how energy expenditure is measured. We'll calculate your basic metabolic rate and your expected energy requirements using equations and physical activity factors. We'll talk about body composition, explain how we assess lean body mass as well as body fat. We'll talk about healthy body weight, explaining methods used to estimate the body weight of an individual, a healthy body weight the individual should be aiming for, and describe how body weight and body fat can affect the health of the individual. And then we'll discuss criteria used to diagnose particular eating disorders and discuss the treatment options for individuals who are suffering from disordered eating patterns. So let's talk about energy balance. Basically, energy balance is how much food do we eat and how much energy do we expend. And we want to have a proper balance between energy intake and energy expenditure in order for us to maintain a healthy body weight. So you are in energy balance when the kilocalories you consume meet your needs in terms of your energy balance. Um, and that means that your weight is going to be stable. Basically, your energy intake is going to equal your energy expenditure equals ma weight maintenance. Now, a negative energy balance is when you're consuming fewer calories than you, ex than you expend. And that means your body is drawing upon stored energy to meet its needs, meaning you will lose weight. This happens if kilocalories in are less than kilocalories out. Or, in other words, your energy intake is less than your energy expenditure, meaning that you're going to be um, entering into weight loss category. Now, a positive energy balance means that you're taking in more kilocalories than you need. That means you have surplus calories that are going to get stored as fat, meaning you will gain weight, basically more kilocalories in and more than kilocalories out, or in another form, more energy intake than energy expenditure means this individual will be suffering from weight gain. So, energy imbalance is going to result in weight gain or loss, and in energy balance means that you will maintain the weight that you were to begin with. Now, a positive energy balance means that you have energy intake is more than your energy expended, means you're going to be suffering from weight gain, increased muscle mass, increased adipose tissue perhaps, perhaps both. This happens during periods of growth and very natural for things like pregnancy or early childhood or adolescence. Um, we can also be in negative energy balance, which happens when energy is expended um, at a higher level than is taken in. For example, food intake is reduced and more energy is expended through exercise, or both can be the case, and this typically results, well, will result in weight loss, fat loss, muscle loss, also loss of glycogen, or water can occur. Now, all of the body processes and physical activity result in the equation energy out, right? So energy needed throughout the day varies for each of the individuals based on a couple of things. First of all, your basal metabolic rate. Secondly, the thermic effect of food and the thermic effect of exercise, as well as what we call adaptive thermogenesis. And if you know your energy expenditure, that allows you to demonstrate the energy balance needed. So if you know how much you're expending, then you know how much you need to be bringing in in order to maintain weight or to create an energy imbalance if you intend to gain or lose weight depending on your exercise goals. So here's a depiction of the total daily energy expenditure. Now, 50 to 70% of your daily energy expenditure is your basal metabolic rate, just taking care of all of your basic metabolic functions. But we also have the thermic um, energy that's going to come from exercise and the thermic energy that comes from food. So thermic energy from exercise is going to include your adaptive thermogenesis and what's called NEAT. And we'll talk about that in just a minute. So TDEE is the total amount of kilocalories that you need to meet your daily energy requirements. And again, this has multiple different components. Um, first of all, it has the basal metabolic rate. How much energy is needed to meet your basic physiological needs? And there are several factors that can influence your basal metabolic rate, including how much lean body mass, um, your age, your gender, body size, genetics, uh, ethnicity, levels of emotional and physical stress, uh, nutritional states, thyroid hormone levels, environmental temperature, um, and your caffeine and nicotine intake. All of these can influence your basal metabolic rate. Now, basal metabolic rate can be difficult to measure because it changes throughout the day a little bit. Um, so your resting metabolic rate is often what we use. Your RMR is often used in exchange. Now, the thermic effect of exercise is the increase in muscle contraction that occurs during physical activity, which means that's basically going to be the amount of kilocalories that you need for this TEE. is going to depend... 
directly on the amount of um, the activity, so a duration of the activity, the type of activity performed, as well as how much you weigh. And then the NEAT is the non-energy activity thermogenesis, so the amount of energy that is suspended from activities that are not considered exercise, just walking around the house doing dishes, that sort of thing. Now the thermic effect of food, that's TEF, is defined as the energy used to process the macronutrients and extract kilocalories from your food. Now approximately 10% of the kilocalories in food is used for your thermic effect of the food, but meals that are higher in protein have a greater TEF than those high in carbohydrate, which are going to have higher TEF than those high in fat. So the highest TEF from protein, middle TEF from carbohydrates, and lowest TEF from meals high in fat. And again, TEF is influenced by multiple different things. The type of nutrients that you consume, for example, the composition of your meal, um, the amount of alcohol that you're intaking along with your food, your age, your athletic training status, etc. All of that can influence the thermic effect of the food. So again, factors that influence thermic effect include the type of fuel. What type of food is it? Greatest effect would be protein, lowest effect would be fat, carbohydrates somewhere in the middle. The composition of the meal. If you consume all three macronutrients together, you have a lower TEF than if you produce protein or carbohydrates separately. So if you add fat in there, you're going to lower your TEF. Um, your fiber content. If you have a higher fiber meal, that's going to lower your TEF. A lower fiber meal is going to increase your TEF. As we get older, TEF is going to decline, so your age is going to play a factor, as well as your environmental temperature. Um, if it's cold, you're going to increase your TEF. If it's warm, it's going to decrease your TEF. Alcohol consumption can also increase your TEF, but again, if alcohol is consumed in a cold environment, that can actually reduce the TEF depending on, so certain things can interact with one another. Intense exercise, so your thermic effect of food is going to be higher immediately after intense exercise. And if you are going to be a trained athlete, overall you're going to have a lower TEF than individuals that are untrained. Same thing with obese individuals. Obese individuals have a lower TEF than normal weight individuals. So all of these different factors can influence the effect that the thermic effect that food has on your body. Now we use energy constantly for what's called adaptive thermogenesis, which is your body's regulation of heat production, right? And that is going to be influenced by multiple different environmental changes. That's influenced by your stress level, your temperature, your diet, etc. And any of these can result in a change in your metabolism, which is the combination of your anabolic and your catabolic pathways in your body. And this is an example of why um, two individuals can have very similar diet and exercise patterns but have completely different body compositions because they might have different adaptive thermogenic capabilities. All right, again, here's some factors involved in energy balance. So all of the energy in, that includes everything that you eat, fats, proteins, carbohydrates, alcohol, all that's energy in. And then energy out is comprised of your basal metabolism, the thermic effect of food, and the thermic effective exercise, which is going to include both that adaptive thermogenesis and NEAT, which we just talked about. So we can use some pretty simple calculations to be able to measure energy expenditure, at least to estimate the total energy expenditure, and we base this on multiple different things, including your age, your gender, height, weight, and also your level of physical activity. And that is how we're able to estimate your estimated energy requirement, or EER. And we can also have calculations to estimate your resting metabolic rate, or RMR, and we'll do this by using what's called the Harris-Benedict equation. Now the HB equation is based on gender, height, weight, and age, and it also is going to require an activity factor, so how much activity you're going to estimate to be on, undergoing on a daily basis, and we'll use that to determine your TDEE, -E, your totally daily energy expenditure. All right, um, your body composition is also going to be useful in this. What is body composition? It's going to be the ratio of fat to lean body mass, basically fat to muscle. And it's usually expressed as a percent body fat. And typically we use this to measure health risks, which are associated with too much body fat. Um, you might remember these calipers they use in gym class. They'll measure the back of your arm or the side of your belly, and they'll be able to tell you your percent body fat by these numbers. Um, we have two different types of fat that make up the total body fat. One is essential fat. This is fat that we need for the body to function. And women are going to have a higher percentage of essential fat, 12%, than men. Men have 3% um, body fat. And we talked about 3% essential body fat. And we talked previously about how body, uh, the bodies of men and women had different compositions, and this is one of the major factors. Now, we also have stored fat. So essential fat is essential for body function, and stored fat is going to be fat that we're putting aside for later use. Basically, this is adipose tissue and sub-Q fat, or fat that's located underneath the skin. Um, we also have visceral fat that is going to be stored around the organs and in the abdominal area. 
This serves to play a role in insulating the body from cold temperatures and to protect and cushion internal organs, but when visceral fat ends up at higher levels, then we can end up with a nice pouch in our abdomen. That looks kind of like this. So here's your sub-Q fat layer right underneath the skin. Right? Um, and then here's all the visceral fat, which is in between all of the abdominal organs. Right? And if you start to lose fat, not only do you lose your abdominal fat, right? That sub Q fat, but you also start losing that visceral fat. And so that's the difference between individuals that's carrying extra weight in the form of adipose tissue and an individual that's more lean on the on the normal body weight range. Now, adipose tissue is storage for fat. So when you're in negative energy balance, that means we're not eating enough food to meet our energy needs, adipose tissue can release fat. And that means that adipocytes or fat cells can shrink and weight can start to be lost. Um, this happens during negative energy balance. Now, when we have positive energy balance, that means that we are bringing in more food than we are, or more calories than we're, cons um, than we're using, then fat can accumulate and the adipose tissue cells can expand. Now we have two different types of fat. So we have a specialty type of fat known as brown adipose tissue. It's a fat tissue that is specialized fat cells that function to generate heat. They have a thermogenic effect. They have much more mitochondria and they have a ton more blood than other adipose tissue. And again, their function is to create heat. So here's a white adipocyte. A white adipocyte stores triglycerides. This is what you think of when you think of adipose tissue or fatty tissue. This is where all the fat's gonna get stored in the form of triglycerides, which we can access later on if we end up in negative energy balance. This is a brown adipocyte. You can see it doesn't store as much triglycerides, and it's gonna have many more mitochondria. So it's gonna be an area that's going to create energy, and it's also gonna be thermogenic, right? So it's going to create heat. All right, so how your body fat is distributed affects your health and your disease risk. So um, central obesity is called android obesity, and this is what happens when you get that extra tire around your belly, it includes excess visceral fat in the abdomen, and this is associated with an increased risk for heart disease, diabetes, hypertension, etc. Um, and visceral fat can also release fatty acids. And when that happens, they can travel to the liver, which can cause resistance to insulin, so it can cause issues with your blood glucose levels. It can also cause an increase in your lousy cholesterol and a decrease in your healthy cholesterol. Um, so your low-density lipoproteins can increase and your high-density li high lipoproteins can decrease. And obviously, it's a ratio of these two. You want more HDL to LDL. Um, and so all of this is going to be bad for your cholesterol levels, as well as the fact that it can increase your overall cholesterol level. Now, another type of obesity is called gynoid obesity, and this is when we have excess fat mainly around the thighs and the buttocks. This would be the apple shape. This would be the pear shape. This is something that's more common in women than in men. Again, if we have half of your weight above the waist, that's going to be the apple or the android style fat, whereas ladies, we tend to end up getting our fat in our hips and our legs and ending up what we call pear-shaped or gynoid fat distribution. Now, we have essential fat. Again, for men, that's 3%. For women, that's 12% of your total body fat. Um, the desirable fat is going to be between 10 and 20% for men and 16 to 26 for women. And over fat or obesity would enter into the 25% or higher for men and 30% or higher for women. Now, how do we assess the body composition? We do this a couple of different ways. Um, we can do what's called hydrostatic weighing. Basically, what we do is we assess the body volume by weighing the individual underwater. It has a very um, small margin of error. And that's because fat weighs more than muscle. I'm sorry. Well, fat has a different weight in water, a different density than um than muscle does. So fat is actually going to give the appearance of being less weight underwater than muscle would. Um, and so underwater weighing can allow us to take out the fat composition and then tell us how much of your body weight is actually considered muscle. Um, we can also use something called the bod pod or the air displacement um, plus mammography, And that's going to measure air rather than your water displacement. And it's also pretty, um, pretty accurate. It's accurate within 3%. We can also use DEXA, or dual energy x-ray absorbitometry. What is this? So this is the most accurate method, and it does bone density scans, and it uses these low energy x-ray beams to measure bone density as well as body mass. And again, that's called DEXA. But one of the ones that we're going to, um, that you'll see probably the most often is called the BIA, or the bioelectrical impedance analysis. And you've probably done this before at the gym or whatnot when you stand with bare feet on what appears to be a scale, but then you put your hands on something as well, and it measures the resistance to the energy current as it travels from your feet to your hands. 
and it's going to travel through muscle and body fat, which are going to have different electrical conductivity, which means that you're going to be able to measure the bioelectrical impedance. Now, it's not as accurate as these body density tests, but it's a heck of a lot easier, and so you're going to see this a lot more frequently. Um, last but not least, we have the waist circumference as an indicator of health risk, as well as that skin fold caliper that I mentioned previously from fifth grade gym class, where they can measure your fat in various locations by pinching in the back of your arm or the side of your belly, etc. Um, and again, the waist circumference is basically just going to indicate where the fat is located, but it's not going to tell you the percentage of body fat, um, because remember, if we have a pear shape versus an apple shape, that might be the same amount of um, extra weight, but it's going to be distributed differently, so the waist circumference will be different in these individuals. Um, however, the waist circumference is associated with a health risk if it's a, over 35 inches in women or over 40 inches in men. Um, all right, we can also use height and weight tables to provide your healthy weight range based on recommendations of what other individuals in your weight brackets or in your size brackets have weight-wise. Um, so it gives you a desirable weight range for a given height based on gender and frame size. However, this can be problematic because it doesn't necessarily represent the entire population as a whole, and original data was never standardized. So the original assumption was that um, the particular weight is associated with body fat. So this works with the normal individuals, but there's a subset of individuals that this will not work with, particularly those individuals that are associating that weight with um, body muscles, such as bodybuilders, etc. So they can end up being given the wrong information, even though they are perfectly healthy in their weight range, um, because it appears that they are overweight, because it's all going to be increased muscle. Um, so th for this reason, most health experts, particularly individuals that are going to be um, dealing with bodybuilders, are going to use the body mass index rather than these height to weight tables to determine what your healthy weight range is for your individuals. All right, so what is a BMI or body mass index? This is going to help us calculate the body weight in relation to the individual's height. And it's a very useful tool to help screen an individual's risk for disease based on their body weight. And we use this table here as a BMI. Basically, you're looking at the height without shoes and the weight without clothing. And you're looking at the height, and then here's the weight. So you're going to find your height. Here I am, 5'4. My good range would be what's this, 115. And then here at, let's say, 145 would enter into my overweight range. My overweight range would enter as this 145 to about 175. And from 175 on, I would be entering into obese. And again, as you get taller, we can afford you for a little bit more weight without being over, be, um, overweight. So if you're six foot four, for example, your healthy weight range can go all the way up to 200 pounds and still be in the healthy weight range. Whereas for me, at 5'4", that would be considered overweight or perhaps even obese. All right, so how do we interpret the BMI value? Basically, we're looking at the um, these individual definitions of underweight, overweight, and obese based on your height. Um, and if we're looking at this approximately, um, their BMI to be underweight is approximately 18.5 kilograms per meter. Your normal weight is 18.5 to 25. Overweight is 25 to 30. And 30 to 40 is going to be obese. Over 40, we're going to end up severely obese. And if we end up in severe obesity, these individuals have a 50 to 100% higher risk of dying prematurely than those of a healthy weight. So really, once we get into the obesity and the severe obesity range, we really can worry about these individuals' lifespans. So it truly does become a health factor for these individuals. Now, BMI is not a direct measure of body fat, and it's not accurate for everyone. Again, for athletes, it might appear to be incorrect. They might have a BMI that's actually lower than... Um, 25, but have a really high muscle mass and low body fat. So it might appear to be in the overweight range, but really they're just in the extremely fit range. Um, additionally, older, older adults that have chronic weight loss might appear to have a healthy BMI, but have significant loss of muscle mass and depletion of nutrient stores and still be in the healthy range, but be suffering from chronic disease conditions. Um, and individuals that are less than five feet high tend to get a little bit tipped on this scale. So really short individuals might appear to have a high BMI, but not be actually be unhealthy. And so we want to take multiple different measurements and combine these measurements to get a really good estimate of an individual's body composition. 
Now, just like being overweight, it increases health risk, so does being underweight. Um, it's a symptom of malnutrition, sometimes substance abuse, oftentimes disease. These individuals have a higher risk of things like anemia and osteoporosis, bone fractures, heart irregularities such as murmurs, and amenorrhea, or a lack of menstrual cycle if you're a female. They're typically correlated, and that can also be related to um, infertility or subfertility issues. Um, it's also correlated with depression and anxiety. And you're, it can be, um, these individuals can have a lower ability to fight off infections and have issues regulating their body temperatures, and they can decrease their muscle strength and also end up at risk of premature death. Um, so these health risks might be unintentional, and they might be happening due to malabsorption. So we could have issues such as cancer or irritable bowel or inflammatory bowel or celiac disease, et cetera. Additionally, certain things can exacerbate this condition, such as certain medications. Um, smoking and substance abuse problems can also cause issues with um, body weight issues. Now, being overweight, again, that also increases health risks. So being overweight, um, overweight and obesity, these guys are associated with increased risk of such heart diseases, hypertension, um, stroke, gallstones, hyperlipidemia, which is the increase of lipids in your um, high lipid la layers in your blood, sleep apnea, and reproductive issues. Additionally, we have cancer um, risks, such as colon cancer, breast, and endometrial and gallbladder cancer risks. And almost all individuals that have type 2 diabetes are also in the overweight category. Over 80% of individuals with type 2 diabetes are overweight. Last but not least, we can also have metabolic syndromes that are associated with these high levels of obesity. So again, obesity can be very bad for the individual. Um, and the percentage of body fat to be considered obese is 32% or higher in females and 25% or higher in males. Um, also, the distribution of the body fat can be either um, in the excess sub-Q, which is going to be subcutaneous, or visceral fat that's stored in the upper body. That's called android obesity. We can also have excess sub-Q fat stored in the lower body, such as the hips, buttocks, and thighs, referred to as gynoid obesity. Um, and for the apple, which is that android obesity, we would measure waist circumference and use that as a measure. For the sub-Q or the pear, we would measure the waist-to-hip ratio. Um, and then also the body mass index is used. The body mass index, or BMI, is used to classify obesity. And if it's over 30 kilograms per meter for women or 25 kilograms per meter for men, that's also going to be considered obese. Um, and obesity can come from disordered eating patterns. Now, there's a lot of different types of disordered eating patterns that can lead to um, excess consumption or um, underconsumption of calories. Basically, anytime we have an abnormal, potentially harmful eating pattern, such as refusing to eat or compulsive eating, or binge eating, restrictive eating, um, purging, so vomiting immediately after eating. Um, oftentimes this binging goes right along with this vomiting because they'll end up eating to excess and then cause themselves to vomit. Or the abuse of things such as diet pills, laxatives, or diuretics. All of these are considered disordered eating habits. Now eating disorders are typically psychological illnesses. They're not just choices that individuals make. Typically they have actually had some sort of psychological disorder that's been diagnosed that um, are very common in young adults and adolescents particularly in upper white middle class and middle class families. Um, again, these disordered eating behaviors and other factors are going to be issues that can be increasing um, among individuals who are at risk groups such as males, minorities, and under other age groups. So while we typically thought of it as being females and uh, white upper middle class families, it really can strike anywhere, any sex, any race, and any age group. And these are some examples of eating disorders such as anorexia nervosa, bulimia nervosa, binge eating nervosa. Um, and this, uh, going to, I'm not going to list all of the different criteria, but basically with anorexia, they're going to have a restriction of calor caloric intake. And definitely this... Uh, Additionally, this is typically going to be associated with a disturbance in the way one is experiencing their body weight. So they will look at themselves and still see fat even when they have bones showing through their hips. Um, bulimia nervosa, uh, nervosa is going to be binge eating. Typically, it's going to be followed by vomiting. Um, and typically, these individuals um, are is not going to occur exclusively during episodes of anorexia nervosa. So it doesn't necessarily mean that these guys are going to have to be equally opposite. Sometimes anorexics can enter into the bulimic category, right? When they finally do eat, then they feel awful about eating. So typically individuals can be suffering from both of these. When they finally do let themselves eat, they have a lack of control and they overeat in excessive amounts. 
Um, and binge eating disorder is when we are, um, again, eating a very large amount of food, definitely larger than most people would eat in a similar period, eat until you are entirely full. Um, and typically, it's not going to be associated with the recurrent use of inappropriate compensatory behavior, for example, what we call purging or vomiting. So typically, this individual is just going to binge eat. They're not going to, um, to vomit as well. And then we also have some other types of feeding or eating disorders that are not classified elsewhere. Um, and basically, any time that individuals are not getting the calories that they need or getting too many calories or having an unhealthy relationship with food, that falls into this category of eating disorders that are not elsewhere classified. Now, as I mentioned, anorexia is going to be self-starvation, essentially. Excessive weight loss, really, really low. These individuals can end up sub-100 pounds. They typically have psychological disorders as well, so they view themselves as fat. They fear that fear getting fat. They fear eating certain foods. After eating ice cream, they sometimes feel compelled to exercise excessively. So they might eat a very small amount of calories and then go to the gym for several hours to try to burn it off much more than they would have actually um they are burning off far more calories than they actually consumed. The health consequences of this typically end up with electrolyte imbalances. So you can end up with weird issues with um, electrolytes in your blood. Oftentimes, they'll need to maintain these electrolytes by having constant supply of um, things like Gatorades, etc. It can also be associated with heart rate and blood pressure problems, fatigue, hair loss is very common because we don't get the nutrients that you need, similar to individuals that are suffering from starvation. Um, the digestive process can be slowed, and sometimes we can end up with inadequate nutrient intake, not just because we're not ingesting the right amount, but also because we're not absorbing the right amount because we're going to have issues with our digestive tract that have occurred from long periods of malnutrition. Um, additionally, they can have inability to regulate their internal body temperatures, so they can have temperature swings um, in, the, in the environment because they simply aren't capable of maintaining homeostasis temp with their temperature. Um, so bulimics or bulimia nervosa, individuals suffering from bulimia nervosa, typically are going to consume large amounts of food in a very short period of time, followed by extreme purging events. And we can see serious health consequences in this and that we can see tooth decay is probably one of the first instances. Dentists typically bring this to other people's attention because oftentimes these individuals have normal weight, right? They're going to be eliminating all that excessive weight that they're bringing in. So oftentimes there are, um, people who love them might not know, but the dentist will know because you'll end up with extensive tooth decay from the stomach acid, also tears in the esophagus and the esophageal membranes. Um, severe electrolyte imbalances can occur as well, as well as dehydration and constipation because you're simply not getting enough liquid in as well. T traditionally, these individuals also are going to be using laxatives, so they're going to be both vomiting and suffering from diarrhea on purpose. So that can impair normal bowel function over extreme periods of time. And this can lead to depression and self-esteem issues because there's often psychological effects and disorders that are associated with this, as well as the fact that they are actually going to be starving their body of some nutrients because they're not ever going to be giving themselves a full meal. Now, binge eating is going to be similar to bulimia nervosa, except it's going to be minus the purging. So these individuals are going to eat for um, large amounts of volumes of food in a short period of time, oftentimes for emotional reasons. They get very sad and will eat an entire thing of ice cream, etc. Um, and this then leads to like an out-of-control feeling where they just simply are not able to stop. Like it's an actual addiction. And they end up with physical and psychological issues, discomfort about eating. They end up ashamed about their behavior. So typically they don't come out and talk to people about this. They'll eat in secret in their room or whatnot. And this can cause severe health consequences as well, such as high blood pressure, high cholesterol, heart disease, diabetes, type 2 diabetes specifically, which is adult onset, um, and gallbladder disorders. Now we also have this orthorexia, um, and this is an individual who is obsessed with healthier, righteous eating. And typically this individual started off with good intentions. They had the desire to lead a healthy lifestyle, but they get to the point where it becomes an obsession. Um, they spend most of their time thinking about food, how it was prepared, was it processed properly, what are the health benefits of this food. They don't typically obsess over the caloric content. They typically are going to obsess more about the micronutrient concentrations. They obsess over eating the healthiest version of a potato, for example. And they eliminate foods based on learning about one negative health effect from eating the food, which eventually ends up food restrictive. So sometimes these individuals can get to the point where they're almost in anorexia conditions because they've restricted a lot of different foods for fear of toxicity or um, poor preparation or processing, etc. So orthorexia is an, an individual who has um, gotten to the point where they've become such a health nut that they've actually started to restrict the amount of food that they're bringing into their body, which can eventually turn into anorexic conditions as well. 
Now this one, I gotta admit guys, this one is me. Um, night eating syndrome. Um, an individual consumes most of their kilocalories after their evening meal and sometimes wake up, wakes up in the middle of the night to eat, particularly when I was pregnant. I would wake up in the middle of the night to eat all of the time. Um, so this is going to be a bad form of eating because if you eat late at night, you're not going to be able to process and digest the food as well as you are throughout the daytime. You have a lower amount of that capability while you're sleeping, so you're going to end up putting more weight on during that time frame. Um, typically, this individual is not going to have an appetite during the morning hours. They're going to skip breakfast. They might skip lunch. They're going to start getting hungry around three or four in the afternoon, have dinner, and then much later at night, way after dinner, start consuming more and more food. Oftentimes, they suffer from low self-esteem and depression and stress, although that wasn't me. I was just suffering from pregnancy. Um, but you do end up feeling guilty and ashamed when you recognize in the morning how much you've eaten. So oftentimes, because you're tired, they may leave all of the food wrappers out on the counter and kind of come to in the morning and go, oh my God, did I really eat an entire carton of ice cream and two boxes? of cookies. Typically, this is very common in younger adults, individuals who um, don't have parents to oversee them anymore, but yet don't necessarily have um, their own structured family lifestyles to have dietary plans for set breakfast, lunch, and dinner time frames. So it's very common in young, ad young adults, 18 to 30 years old. Um, all right, so here's the morning signs for eating disorders. So if they have a very low body weight, if it's 85% or lower, that can be a symptom of a disorder. Um, and some individuals who exercise excessively, for example, or have a preoccupation with food, their weight, and their diet, oftentimes they'll have a distorted body image, particularly individuals who are very skinny. However, they comment on being fat, even if they are very obviously underweight. Um, food aversion, refusing to eat. So they'll avoid food or avoid certain foods, such as those high in fat and sugar, and only eat a ton of celery and carrots. Um, for ladies, this can result in, aim, um, in becoming having no menstrual, uh, in amenarchy, which means you have no menstrual cycle, your periods become irregular, completely absent, and that's simply because their body doesn't have enough body fat to be able to support a pregnancy, and so this individual becomes high risk for the pregnancy, um, and your body knows that, and so it's going to end up into partially infertile conditions or subfertile conditions. If you see individuals have excessive diet pill use or laxative use or have extreme changes in mood, additional things include hair loss um, or not eating in public, only eating alone, always making excuses to avoid eating with others might indicate that they have eating problems behind closed doors. All of these are warning signs for disordered eating or eating disordered. Um, now we can have an RDT or a registered dietitian nutritionist that can help establish normal eating behaviors for someone suffering from an eating disorder. Oftentimes these nutritional approaches include meal planning and using food journals. So if we can lay out the right amount of calories for this individual for the day, they can approve it and sign off on it. Even if it is calorie restrictive, it's still going to be probably more calories than they were eating themselves. Um, and then they can stick to those plants and using food journals can indicate what they are eating or not eating, what they're avoiding, and that'll help us identify triggers, triggers for binges or triggers for um, anorexic um, avoidances, right? So food aversions. It can also identify foods that they consider to be safe and unsafe. And then this will allow you to have um, kind of a handle on the ability to just to at least begin discussion on the psychological issues that they may be suffering from. Um, additionally, these individuals typically have difficulty recognizing regular hunger cues or fullness cues because they've already gotten to the point where they're so used to always being hungry or so used to always being full if they're overeaters that they are not going to have... Um, a good handle on what it feels like to be hungry or what it feels like to be full. However, the good news is that eating disorders are able to be completely overcome. So full recovery is possible and highly successful if the disorder is treated early um, and if it's treated consistently. So thank you guys so very much for sticking with me through this lecture today. I really appreciate your time. Oh, I apologize. It's not finished. No, it is. It's done. All right, so I must have put two things together here. So I'm going to continue on with this slideshow here. I have thought that it was over, but it appears that we have, we've only reached the halfway part. Um, so now we're going to talk about, previously we just talked about energy balance. Now we're going to talk about weight management. All right, so weight management is very important to an individual's health and well-being. Um, we will discuss things like appetite and hung, being hungry, talk about being satiated or full, and we'll talk about different physiological factors involved in regulating the amount of food an individual takes. And then we'll talk about adipocytes, so we can have hyperplasia or hypertrophy, which are different ways that um, adipocytes can grow or um, end up 
um, making many copies of themselves in the development of obesity, so growing growth and division. And then we'll discuss the role of genetics and the environment in developing underweight, um, overweight, and obese characteristics. Last but not least, we'll talk about diet and exercise so that we can achieve weight loss and reasonable goals and healthy exercise and food plans. And we'll talk about the role of diet and exercise in achieving your healthy weight gain or loss. And last but not least, we'll talk about weight loss drugs and surgery and their role in the reduction of obesity. All right, so obesity in America is on the rise. From the early 60s to today, we have had a drastic change in the percentage of Americans that were overweight from 32 to 67% of Americans. In fact, it's not just all of the Americans, particularly it's the children. Over 33% of adults and 16% of children are obese. And these individuals, if you start off with obesity as children, you have a very slim chance of reaching a normal weight um, as an adult. And Americans are so known for their shortcuts that we spend over $60 billion annually on weight loss solutions and get, um, get skinny quick fixes. But unfortunately, there really aren't very many. It simply comes down to calories in, calories out, right? It's what you eat versus how much you exercise. However, because we have all of these obese individuals, the U.S. healthcare is going to be inundated with obesity-associated medical conditions. We spend over $190 billion annually on medical conditions associated with being overweight. So the goal of weight management is to maintain a body weight of approximately 18.5 to 25% body mass index. Um, we want to have a healthy weight, so a body weight that does not increase the risk of developing weight-related problems or diseases and has a, um, carries with it a lower risk of chronic diseases. So in 2013, obesity became such a problem in America that the AMA declared obesity a disease. And while it is kind of a choice, the benefits to declaring it a disease means that we can have clear warnings to the health hazards being put out there to the individuals. And it means that we can guarantee that obese individuals get insurance coverages for treatment options. And that we might be able to get research funding allocated to addressing this drastic problem of obesity that we have here in the United States. However, when we call something a disease, it means that individuals are able to say, oh, it's not my problem, it's not my fault, there's nothing I can do to change it. Um, it also means that individuals, instead of taking action in their own hands, may turn to treatments like drugs and medical procedures to address the epidemic, instead of encouraging lifestyle changes, which really is where the problem is. And um, the costs for treating obesity, obesity are on the rise, they're um, intending, they're at the point where they are really high and they are only going to skyrocket in the near future. Again, that's because we have declared it a disease. Um, there's a little bit of discrimination associated with being overweight as well. Overweight people tend to be treated differently than people at a normal weight. They're more likely to be denied job promotions and raises. They're less likely to be accepted into higher ranked colleges, etc. Um, sometimes people have the perception that they're lazy or weak-willed and therefore can't get the job done. Um, they also have higher rates of suicide and higher alcohol and drug dependency rates than individuals with normal weights. On the flip side, being underweight carries its own risks. So individuals who are underweight tend to be at a greater risk for um, irritability, anger, and depression problems. So how do we view the issue of being hungry versus being satiated? So appetite is defined as the desire to eat food, whether or not there is a physical hunger. So you can have an appetite, even though you've just eaten, that's been triggered by the smell of something delicious, for example. Whereas hunger is the physical sensation associated with the need, need for or intense desire for food. And satiety is the feeling of being fullness, of being full, saying, I'm actually not hungry anymore. And that's produced by the consumption of food. And all of these are going to be regulated by the brain and hormones. So the feeding of the individual is regulated by the brain and the hormones. So some of the hormones that stimulate satiety are going to be depicted here in blue, and some hormones that stimulate hunger are going to be depicted here in yellow. So neurons, uh, sorry, hormones that stimulate hunger include neuropeptide Y, it's created in the hypothalamus and stimulates hunger. In the stomach, we create something called ghrelin, which is going to be stimulated when the stomach is empty. And both of these are going to give your brain the hunger um, impulse. 
Now we also have some things that are going to stimulate being satiated or being full, and that includes insulin, which is going to be involved in blood glucose regulation. It's released in the pancreas as soon as carbohydrates are ingested, and that's because insulin is going to help with the process of regulating blood sugar, and when carbohydrates are ingested, they're going to get broken down into sugar, so that's going to increase the spike in your blood glucose levels, um, and insulin is going to be there to help bring that glucose back down. Um, leptin is going to be produced by your fat tissue, so it's produced by adipocytes, and it's released into the blood to stimulate the feeling of satiety as well. We also have peptide YY, which is released by the small intestines once kilocalories have been consumed. So once food comes into the small intestines, the small intestines are going to shut off the hunger um, reflex. And also CCK or cytokinin is going to be released in the small intestines. And that happens when chyme or a little bit of processed food that comes out of the stomach is going to enter into the duodenum. And that's going to signal to the body, hey, food's here. We don't need to eat anymore. All of these are going to um, downregulate the hunger response. And all of these are going to stimulate the hunger response. All right, so as I mentioned, satiety or the feeling of being full is triggered by CKK and peptide YY. Um, these are going to be secreted in the small intestines and they help stimulate the feeling of being full. We also have leptin, which is produced by fat tissue, which decreases hunger and the amount of food that you intake, as well as regulating the amount of fat stored. Um, it also decreases with weight loss. The amount of leptin that's produced decreases with weight loss, so you start um, not getting satiated as quickly. And also it's going to be associated with intake of certain vitamins and minerals. Um, now, certain macronutrients, such as protein particularly, are going to help promote the feeling of being satiated or being full, and that's going to help reduce our food intake because if we have a high-protein diet and we are going to feel full, we might feel full before we reach the amount of calories that we would normally be consuming, so that might help reduce our food intake. Now, again, hunger is going to be controlled by a particular hormone such as ghrelin, which is going to be secreted by the stomach, and neuropeptide Y produced in the hypothalamus. These are both going to um, stimulate hunger. It's going to Basically, the ghrelin is going to tell the hypothalamus the body needs energy, and it's going to, again, stimulate the feeling of hunger when we're on a low kilocalorie diet. And lean individuals, you tend to have higher ghrelin levels. That means individuals that have low levels of fat reserves are going to feel hungry more quickly um, because they're going to need to have constant food supply. Um, neuropeptide Y, again, produced by the hypothalamus, is going to be activated by ghrelin, and it's going to also stimulate hunger. Now, leptin is going to drop when adipose tissue shrinks, and a drop in leptin is going to stimulate hunger. So basically, if fat tissue is getting smaller, that means you're getting into your fat reserves. That means you're probably not eating enough food to be able to meet your body's needs. Um, and so that's going to stimulate hunger so that you'll end up consuming more food. All right, so let's talk about fat cells. Fat cells are adipocytes, and fat cells can grow in two different ways. One, they can expand to store more fat. That's called hypertrophy. That's when they get larger here. But they can also produce more fat cells. That's called hyperplasia, so we can make more and more and more of them. So how do we start? This is called a preadipocyte. It's going to be a precursor to an adipocyte cell. These are immature cells. They're formed from stem cells. And when fat comes in, they're going to get stored. So fat droplets are now stored inside what has now become a mature adipocyte. From this point, we can undergo um, hyperplasia or increase in the number of adipocytes. So now we have here one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, probably one in the back, let's say eight, maybe nine. And then we can undergo hypertrophy, which is the process of increasing the size of the adipocytes. And this is what happens during weight gain until they reach a certain point and then they'll divide again. Unfortunately, although we can have hyperplasia events occurring, that means making more and more of the adipocyte cells, when we lose weight, all that happens is hypotrophy, that means trophy, that means that we're going to get smaller and smaller, but we're never going to eliminate the number of adipocytes. Um, so while we have regions where we're going to be creating a lot of fat during time, just certain time points in our lifestyles, um, we can end up to the point where we are making more and more fat cells, but all we do is lose the size of the fat cells as we lose the weight. The amount of cells is going to remain the same. All right, so as I mentioned, adipocytes can shrink in size with weight loss, but the number of cells does not decrease. All right, so average adults has between 30 to 50 billion adipocytes. They hold 0.4 to 0.5 micrograms of fat each. Um, overweight individuals have larger adipose cells that can hold 0.6 to 1.2 micrograms of fat each, so almost double, and that's what I'm going back to the hypertrophy, right? These cells can get larger and larger, and in fat individuals or overweight individuals, we can have large amounts of adipose tissue inside each of the adipose cells. 
Um, now, adipocytes do shrink in size with weight loss. Again, we're not going to lose any of the cells, however. And after weight loss, we're going to have small felt cells that can be readily filled with excess energy. Now, fat growth and production continues throughout life, but that hyperplasia is going to slow as we get older. All right, so let's talk about particular enzymes that are going to be involved in the storage of fat. So lipoprotein lipase is going to increase lipogenesis, or the creation of lipids. And hormone-sensitive lipase stimulates lipolysis, or the breakdown of lipids. So heavier, protein, or sorry, heavier people have increased LPL activity. Um, men have LPL more active in their visceral region, their abdominal fat cells, whereas women have a higher LPL activity in the hips and thighs. And that's why men are, tend to be more of the apple and women tend to be more of the pear. All right, adipocytes are going to secrete a hormone known as adiponectin, which is going to improve the body's response to insulin, reduce fat accumulation in the liver and the muscle, enhance energy expenditure, and it tends to be lower in obese individuals and individuals that have um, type 2 diabetes. So that means these individuals um, with lower amounts are going to be less responsive to insulin and are going to have higher amounts of fat accumulated in the liver and have um, lower energy expenditure, etc. So if we have lower amounts of adiponectin, this can tend to have people becoming more and more obese. Now, some individuals are able to store more fat with excess energy intake. Um, so other individuals are going to store a little bit less fat with energy intake. So some people are more predisposed to weight loss or gain um, how, and because that can be two different genes. And additionally, different genes can also um, have different rates of what's called thermogenesis, right? So the amount of energy or um, temperature that's going to be used, created from that, um, that fat. All right, so we have... A theory called a genetic set point where a body has a particular weight law or weight that it's aiming for and the body is going to fight to remain that specific weight and oppose any attempt at weight loss. Um, however, although this is something that people tend to, to fall back on as a reason for the failure of their diet, the theory isn't true. Um, and the set point, if it is true, the set point is easily overridden. So individuals who have extreme weight issues can override this and have the weight loss occur. However, they really do have to use the calories in, calories out method. And what that means is that they have to maintain a negative energy balance. Otherwise, they simply aren't going to lose the weight. Um, now, individuals do tend to be more genetically prone to being overweight or overbeast than other individuals, but those individuals are able to overcome that predisposition by engaging in exercise regularly and more healthy eating patterns. Now, it is a lot easier, particularly as us Americans, our first world nation in general, to be able to have a positive energy balance and to gain weight. Why? Most of the time, our foods are eaten away from home. Dining out is much more frequent than eating at home. Dining out is often associated with a higher BMI. Why? Because there's something about the process of cooking, the smelling of the items on the stove, etc., that tends to be part of that satiety process, that feeling of being full. And if we don't, if we skip that part and we only shovel the food into our mouth, we're skipping a little bit of the part that makes us feel like we are full. Um, additionally, when we dine out, we're much less likely to choose fruits and vegetables when we dine out than when we would at home. And our serving sizes are typically all over the place when we dine out. So we may eat more in one sitting than we intend to. Additionally, we have an abundant food supply, and our portion distortion is crazy here in the United States. We have um, easy access to food. You're able to eat more or drink more because we're given larger portions. If you think about the serving size for a small Coca-Cola at McDonald's versus a small Coca-Cola at McDonald's in Japan, it's almost double the size, um, triple the size even, because what we consider to be small is much larger than what the individuals in Japan consider to be small. And if you're given a large portion, you tend to eat more than you would if you were given a small portion. You're less likely to go back for a second serving than you are to finish those last couple of bites on your plate. And if the food is packaged in a nice presentation, people tend to eat or drink more if it's put on a larger bowl or a plate or a package. Additionally, Americans tend to have a lack of physical activity. We also tend to have increased sedentary behavior. We do less manual labor in our jobs. Um, we drive more for longer periods of time to get to work, which means that we're less engaged in physical activity. And especially now with COVID, most of our time is spent in front of the TV or in front of the computer. And that means that we're sedentary for that entire time. 
All right, so how can we lose weight healthfully? So the goal for reasonable weight loss is to lose 10% of the body's weight over six months' time. So whatever your target range is, it should be about 10% of what your normal, what your body weight is now, and you divide that by six to how much you should be losing approximately every month. And then you aim to lose that weight by modifying your diet, by increasing your physical activity, and your behavior. And really, again, this all comes down to kilocalories in, kilocalories out. So those kilocalories do count. Choose your lower kilocalories calorie foods, reduce your portion sizes, increase the amount of kilocalories that go out, eat more vegetables, more fruit, more fiber, and avoid mindless eating. Avoid empty calories such as alcohol, right? And just pay attention to what you are putting into your body so that you can also increase the amount of exercise if you know that you have eaten more than you normally do. Um, one of the other things that I would like to point out here is that if you find yourself in front of a computer for long periods of time, you might want to switch to a standing desk or to a yoga ball or something like that, which is going to actually um, cause you to burn calories while you are standing or even while you are sitting as opposed to just sitting completely sedentary. All right, you also should be looking at the energy density of foods. Now, energy density refers to the amount of kcals that you're going to get out of the food that you're consuming. So low energy foods are going to be high in water and high in fiber, such as most vegetables and fruits. Um, or foods that's going to have medium energy density is going to um, have less water, and include things like hard-cooked eggs, bagels, dried fruits, steaks, etc. And foods that are going to provide 4 to 9 kcals per gram are going to be high in fat, typically low in moisture, and are going to include things like chips, cookies, crackers, cakes, pastries, butter, oil, and bacon. So anything with those greases in there. All right, so how else can we continue to lose weight healthfully? Well, we can add protein and fat to your meals. Protein is going to promote the satiety, which is going to focus, of course, on the lean protein. And then a little bit of fat is going to help slow the motion out of the stomach. So focus on eating healthy fats and, of course, moderation. And limit your fats high in saturated fats. And if you need examples, you can always refer back to my plate for a weight loss guide. And again, calories in, calories out. So we just talked about calories in, but we also need to talk about calories out. You need to increase your physical activity in order to lose weight. So increase your kilocalories burned and displace your sedentary activity with even mild exercise activity. A mere 60 to 90 minutes daily of moderate intensity of physical activity can help aid in your weight loss and prevent your weight gain. Additionally, try to incorporate cardiorespiratory and straight strength training activities. A lot of these activities can be done behind your desk, right? Just grab a, a weight and start doing some weight lifting or something like that to help get stronger muscle tone while you're sitting behind your computer. Um, additionally, the point that it, this is making here is that spot reducing is when you're trying to attempt to, I only want to get rid of the fat at the back of my arms. I only want to get rid of the fat in my belly. I only want to get rid of the fat in my buttocks. Spot reducing simply does not work. You're going to reduce the weight overall over the entire body. Um, so targeting particular areas is just not going to be feasible unless, of course, you are targeting them with something like liposuction, which we can talk about that at a little bit later. This is just a table demonstrating the amount of kilocalories that are going to be burned during normal activities. Everything from just stretching can burn some activity or burn some calories to physical activity like hiking and gardening and dancing. Vigorous fit, um, Vigorous physical activity includes like running and bicycling and swimming. Um, we can also include things like aerobics and walking around and playing basketball and heavy yard work, etc. Um, all of that falls into the, the vigorous physical activity section as well. Okay, we have to make sure that we modify our behaviors. And so we have to break our bad habits. Making a change for one day is not going to make a change. We have to make a change going forward. So in order to do that, if you want to focus on the behavior that you want to change, you have to focus on the behavior that you're currently experiencing. So first, keep a food log. Talk about how much food goes in. So you know your calories in and your calories out. Um, and then control your environmental cues that trigger eating when you're hungry. So make sure that you know what it is that are your major food triggers and try to avoid those, and then also learn how to better manage your stress. You want to make sure you maintain the energy gap reduction in kcals in order to maintain the weight loss. What does that mean? You have to have that negative energy balance. So you have to reduce the kcals coming in and also increase the kcals going out. So decrease your portions, decrease the fatty foods, eat smaller, more frequent meals. However, the caution here is to make sure it does not turn into grazing. Right? Grazing is when you eat one or two bites of food all day long, which adds up very quickly to many more calories than you would normally eat had you simply eaten three meals a day. You also make sure you maintain a high level of physical activity. Again, calories in, calories out. 
Additionally, if you weigh yourself weekly to be able to notice the small gains or losses in your weight, that can help you maintain your weight loss and keep you on track. It becomes very easy to say, I don't see any difference and to give up. But really, you are making small strides every week. And so if you're able to measure those, that will help you keep on track. Now, we've just talked about weight loss, but there's a subset of individuals who have issues with gaining weight. So individuals who are underweight can be have issues um, gaining that weight because the goal is to gain muscle, not all fat. It's very easy to add adipose tissue, but really what we'd like to do is strengthen the muscle. And so the methods to do this include additional calories which should add about one pound of extra body weight per week. Energy dense foods, so we don't want to just add a bunch of cake cows. We want to make sure that we're adding cake cows that are going to have the right amount of nutrients in there as well. And we want to make sure that we include regular exercise and resistance training. So we want to make sure that we're physically exercising as well as consuming extra, um, extra energy. This shows you the more and less energy dense food choices by food group. And let's talk about some medical interventions. So for extreme obesity, there are some types of weight loss uh, medications, some that are going to suppress your appetite, for example, make you less hungry. Some are going to inhibit your fat absorption, so you can eat all the fat you want, it's just going to pass right on through you. Um, we also have lorcaserin, which can help stimulate the feeling of being full, which helps reduce food intake. Um, some of the other things that I've researched include a tongue patch, where they sew a patch of fabric on the top of your tongue, and it makes it just extremely uncomfortable to swallow. So you've switched to an almost entirely liquid diet, and if you try to cheat from that liquid diet, it's a very, very very uncomfortable feeling to have the stitches which are left on straight, scrape against the top of your mouth and back of your throat. Um, we can also, for extreme, um, extreme methods, we can undergo a gastric bypass surgery or bariatric surgery. In this way, basically, we have staples where we have an entire region of the stomach that's going to get bypassed. So what we'll do is we will have a much smaller amount of stomach that's left after we close off this other part of the small um, stomach. So we have a small pouch that's left that can only hold about a quarter cup of the food at a time. Now remember, the entire stomach used to be able to hold a gallon, and some individuals who eat excessively are able to stretch much for, further than that. And so now we're only able to eat a very small amount of food, which means that these individuals have to consume meals very frequently, but very small amounts of them. They also typically are going to have to take supplements for things like iron, vitamin B12, calcium, and vitamin C. Why? because we are going to be on a restricted diet for a little while and we want to make sure that we're getting those nutrients into those individuals while we are restricting the calories. Now, typically these individuals can see a weight loss of up to 15 pounds per week for the first couple of months, and then they'll still see another two pounds or so per week lost for the first six months. Um, this means that we're going to see extreme measures of weight loss. They're going to happen very quickly. Oftentimes these individuals will then have to undergo secondary surgeries to remove the fat pouches or the skin pouches that are left after the fat has left their body. Um, typically, this will help eliminate diabetes and hypertension. No, instead of what we just saw, which was the gastric bypass, we're going to staple this off so no food's ever going to enter into this region. And they also take a piece of the small intestines and pop it up here so the path of food is still going to go out of the stomach into the small intestines. Another option is a gastric banding. So here we're going to put um, the banding around the stomach. It's a little bit less invasive than the stapling. And the um, food is able to go through, but it still is going to feel like you're full very quickly. So we're going to put a silicone band here on the top of the stomach. It's going to greatly reduce the amount of size. It's not going to be able to stretch very far without feeling extremely uncomfortable. And while food is going to be able to pass in, um, you're going to be eating far less. So while we will, will still be seeing weight loss, typically it's not as extreme as the weight loss that we saw um, or we would be seeing with the gastric bypass surgery. All right, thank you so very much for listening to my entire lecture. Aloha, everyone, and happy studying.